This panel is really going to be about post-colonialism and I think the actual sport and form of cricket. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Rashna Singh from Colorado College, who's written a number of publications and books on literature and empire and post-colonial literature. Thank you for coming. So I'm going to begin and my title is Court at Midwicket, CLR James and Cricket as Cultural Performance. Was cricket the ultimate manifestation of the Pax Britannica? In Beyond a Boundary, a book that resists genre classification, CLR James gestures towards this notion. As any avid cricketer will insist, cricket is more than a game. It is a way of life, or what James describes as a code. While the code, the game, and the book itself is bound up with masculinity, cricket spectatorship comprises both men and women. I can testify to that having attended many test matches myself as I was growing up in India. James relates that in the classical education afforded by his school, Queen's Royal College, administered by the government of the then British colony of Trinidad, he studied Latin, French, Greek, and much else. But above all, he learned and obeyed a code, the English public school code, a code upheld by Britain and her empire. Tacit abrogation of the code may have been possible in the schoolhouse, but not on the cricket field. That meant accepting the umpire's decision without question, even if it was irrational, subordinating personal inclinations and interests to the team, and acknowledging the success of opponents, even when they did not deserve it. Any fracture of this code was met with severe denunciation. Eton or Harrow had nothing on us, James states. In that short declarative sentence, James effects a moving of the center from the two most iconic and well-known of British public schools to a relatively remote school in one of the outposts of Britain's vast empire and metonymically from the metropole to the colonies. This paper will examine how James decenters cricket itself so that it is no longer simply the iconic sport of the English, but an indigenous game as, that is as organic to Queen's Park Oval or Eden Gardens as it is to Lord's. The cricket field was both a unifying and leveling factor. Cricket then becomes much more than a game. It becomes an emblem of identity as cultural production as Stuart Hall theorizes. Cricket is not, of course, the single source of indoctrination with regard to the code. As schools go, remarks James about his alma mater, it was a very good school, though it would have been more suitable to Portsmouth than to the port of Spain. James also notes the influence of books and magazines, such as the boy's own paper. In my study of children's literature, in the context of the British Empire, a book called Goodly is Our Heritage, Children's Literature, Empire, and the Certitude of Character, I reference how the children's literature of the British Empire worked within a national and political framework and became an imagining agency that serviced the colonial agenda. Antonio Gramsci famously noted that hegemony does not issue from the barrel of a gun, but from moral and intellectual consensus. For James, the code was exactly the moral and intellectual consensus that Gramsci describes. J 
James explains, from the eight years of school life, this code became the moral framework of my existence. It has never left me. I learned it as a boy. I have obeyed it as a man, and now I can no longer laugh at it. Cricket afforded that consensus to boys and men throughout the empire, and women in multiple ways participated in, or at least sustained that code as spectators. Is this the cultural bomb that Ngugi Wa Thiongo so famously describes in Decolonizing the Mind? The cultural bomb, according to Ngugi, was the biggest weapon unleashed by imperialism, the effect of which was to annihilate a people's belief in themselves. Cricket James' book tells us creates instead a type of parallax. Cricket carries a social load, the load of social response and implications. It was part of a zeitgeist. Cricket, in fact, contributes to a sense of history and heritage, not only the history and heritage of the British game, but the history and heritage of its renowned players from the far reaches of the empire. James treasures the Jubilee Book of Cricket by the celebrated Indian cricketer Ranji Singhji, who is a presence throughout the book, and he devotes entire sections to West Indian greats, and you know, a whole list of them, you've heard a lot about them, especially, of course, Larry Constantine. Cricketing nations enshrine such names and celebrate the capacities. It is not too much of a stretch to say that the names of legendary cricketers count in cricketing nations' belief in their capacities and even in themselves. When James famously rewrites Kipling's question about the English and what should they know of England who only England know as what should they know of cricket who only cricket know, he notes that West Indians crowding to tests carry with them the entire history and the future hopes of the islands. These are not the flanneled fools that Kip, Rudyard Kipling marked in the islanders, given to delusion or wholly believing a lie. These are heroes, the West Indian equivalent of Drake and Nelson. What sets apart the code and cricket is that it bound both colonizer and colonized. Both were obliged to uphold it. Read the books of Worrell and Walcott, James admonishes, and see how native to them is the code. Here again, James says something significant that the reader can easily skip over. The code is not simply something that is appropriated or absorbed. It is native. This is the strange fruit of a transplanted consciousness, transplanted and transformed as transplanted species don't merely grow in other soils, but put down morphological roots there. James indicates that cricketing nations do not simply appropriate the mother culture or become its marginal expression, but perform and thus indigenize it. Not only is it significant that James sees cricket as serving society, but it is significant that in an early essay about a classic match between Oxford and Cambridge, he says, I retold it in my own words as if it were an experience of my own, which indeed it was. Here, James claims cricket for Anglophone post-colonial countries as a birthright, not simply as a borrowing. Beyond the Boundary is not just a cricket narrative from the margins of the cricketing empire that subverts this center, it splits it off into multiple centers. Neither James nor his book then is contaminated by colonialism as is often assumed, nor does James and his book contaminate cricket. There's instead a reshuffle, an unsettling, a redeployment of power relations that is affected by this book. In claiming cricket for multiple centers, James also tacitly refuses English exceptionalism and its exclusive claim to the values of the code, sportsmanship, fairness, and so on, simultaneously disrupting, as Simon Gikandi points out, the civilizational authority of Englishness. James historicizes the code 
and its connection with cricket by tracing its lineage to Victorian times and especially Thomas Arnold and rugby, showing how cricket became the basis of a national culture. A straight back and it isn't cricket became the watchwords of manners and virtue and the guardians of freedom and power, quote. Throughout Beyond the Boundary, James' cultural reference are not only Western but canonical, with references to the canonical works of English literature as well as to Greek drama. Cricket and literature are frequently linked. James also addresses the importance of good spectatorship in cricket. A cricketing nation is an imagined community with spectators cheering not only a national team, but first-rate test cricket. Further, cricketing nations together constitute an imagined community. And James eloquently expresses that notion in his 1969 essay, Garfield Sobers. So Garfield Sobers was, of course, one of the greatest all-rounders of all times that the cricketing ethos envisages not only the success of a side, but the enjoyment of good cricket is eloquently expressed by James. And that's the quotation where he talks about how, you know, not only in the crowded towns and hamlets of the United Kingdom, but in the scattered villages of the British Caribbean, the green hills and wells of South Africa, and the plains of Southern India and the mountains of Northern India, people, were cheering you know, the success of the West Indian side. While James saw Caribbean identity as intimately bound up with Englishness, he also disrupted colonial axiologies and tropes in cricket writing, as Anthony Bateman points out. James is certainly conscious of the racist mind-body dichotomy that Bateman describes, for instance, and purposefully depicts Constantine's leg glance from outside the off stump to long leg as a classical stroke. It would be hard to miss the irony when James notes that Constantine's prowess was not due to his marvelous West Indian eyes, and I'm quoting here from, you know, Cardis's writing, marvelous West Indian wrists, but to his marvelous West Indian brains. Bateman points out that in writing about Sobers, the key words in James' description are orthodoxy, discipline, and classical, all words that an Orientalist vocabulary reserves for the perceived Occident. In his preface to Constantine's Cricket and I, noted cricket correspondent for the Manchester Guardian, Neville Cardis, uses the racial and racist idiom of the time in celebrating Constantine's abilities. This is cricket typology, connecting the qualities of a player with his country of origin, and Cardis is in the tradition of early ethnographers who describe the strange people they observed in their travels. Quote, Constantine is a representative man. He is West Indian cricket, just as W.G. Grace was English cricket. When we see Constantine bat or bowl the field, we know he is not an English player, not an Australian player, not a South African player. Cardis then goes on to describe Constantine in terms that recall Joseph Conrad's descriptions of the natives that Marlowe encounters on Heart of Darkness, of course, as he goes upriver to find Kurtz. Savages who howled and leaped and spun. Cardis portrays Constantine's leapings and clutchings and dartings and attributes them to impulses born in a blood heated by the sun and influenced by an environment and a way of life much more natural than ours. Like Conrad's boiler man, Constantine is an improved specimen of nature. Cardis describes Constantine's movements in the field as primitive in their pouncing veracity and unconscious beauty, concluding tellingly that Constantine is not only a genius, but representative 
words such as elemental, instinctive, impulse, intuitions, natural, abound in Cardus's descriptions of Constantine, words which are part of a stock Orientalist vocabulary. In writing that directly recalls Thomas Carlyle's obsession with pumpkins in his occasional discourse on the nigger question, Cardus describes the West Indian players as lovable when they smile and reveal white teeth, making him think of melons and the friends of nursery days in old plantation tales. There's a hint of fear at the racial power with which Constantine batted, as well as a betrayal of colonial anxieties when Cardus notes that it is, quote, as every West Indi Indian boy wishes and determines to bat, and when he links the style to Ranjit Sinji. Finally, Cardus makes the inevitable and unabashed link to the jungle. Quote, yet there was no excess of muscular effort in Constantine's swift plunderings. It was the attack and savagings of a panther on the kill, sinuous, stealthy, strong, but unburdened. Then it comes, the batmanship of the jungle. Beautiful, ravaging, marvelously springy, swift as the blow of a paw. But Cardus goes on to to reassure colonial anxieties by assuring readers that savage though it may seem, quote, it was happy, genial, smiling batting, true to the good nature of Constantine himself. Like a schoolboy with a catapult, he killed without intent to kill. The beast is tamed, he knows his place. The half devil is really half child after all to borrow Kipling's infamous description of conquered peoples. This is the racialized cricket journalism that James is writing against. Yet it was Cardis who hired him to cover county cricket for the Manchester Guardian. Rather than Cardis's imagery, James gets more exercised by the fact that while Cardis introduces music into his cricket writing, the reverse is not true. While cricket is certainly not free from racial tensions, it does not share football's unfortunate heritage of racial hooliganism. That simply would not be cricket. Commenting on the fact that a quarter of the, a million of the citizens of Melbourne spilled into the streets to bid farewell to the West Indian cricketers after the Test Series of 1961, James eloquently tells us, Clearing their way with bat and ball, West Indians at that moment had made a public entry into the Committee of Nations. But clearing the way for what? An entry into the Committee of Nations, or more radically, an entry into the humanity so long denied them. Bateman points to the irony in the fact that the conservative Cardis drew more attention to the harsh realities of Victorian social relations in the context of cricket than the Marxist James. Even more ironically, it was Kipling who pathologized cricket as an imperial tool. Yet cricket teams have historically included players of color, both Ranjit Singhji and his nephew Dilip played for England as well as played county cricket in England. The West Indian side was multiracial while the Brit islands were under British control, although it's one of James' main grievances that it took so long to appoint a West Indian the captain. So I'm afraid I have to cut off my paper at that point, but what I go on to talk about is to see uh, the cricket field as a sort of liminal space that is mediated by the fact that James points out there are always two batsmen present, unlike in baseball, and one batsman is always on the same side as the bowler, of course. So how, how the cricket pitch itself becomes a kind of liminal space that uh, that lends itself to, to uh, two subject positions. And then I go into a bit of theory from Homi Baba to kind of back this up. But thank you. So our second presentation is from Walter Purcell from 
Mahodol University International College, uh, Thailand. Uh, Walter has been working in postcolonial studies for about the past 30 years, but more importantly, he's a cricketer and then he's played cricket across the world. Good afternoon. Civilizing cricket, can India bowl out white supremacy? In Global English and Transcultural Flows, Alistair Pennycook tells the story of a British judge faced with a conflict over legal ownership of an English hip-hop song, declared that the lyrics was utterly beyond his comprehension. This anecdote suggests that England can no longer lay claim to complete understanding and mastery over an essential aspect of its culture, the English language. More analytically, it illustrates that a cultural export of England, after a career in the British Empire, can flow back into the centre in a form that is not only unrecognisable, but also disarticulating to traditional English institutions of power and influence. In the 21st century, the career of cricket seems to be following that of the English language, and perhaps to be doing even more damage. From the mid-19th century, cricket was another major cultural export that an essential flank in the cultural production of British colonial power. As elsewhere in cricket and the wider discursive sphere of its representations and administration, the British elaborated the colonial racial ideology of white supremacy. And like the English language, cricket has returned home to haunt the old colonial master, as Thomas Macaulay's and Lord Harris's excitable orientals of the empire strike back using their massive crowds with their brash forms of fandom and fanaticism for cricket, their Bollywood choreographed song and dance, their astonishing economic and financial growth in the last two decades, their billionaire businessmen, their clear technical superiority in information technology, sports marketing, and cricket administration, combined with cricket's new form, T20, to bypass the old cricketing world order. And these have pushed England on the back foot forcing the old master to look for a window beyond the traditional boundaries of MCC, ICC trusteeship and veto power, Australian comradeship, the lyrical prose of Neville Carter summoning the enchanting beauty and mythical power of the pastoral village green in the English countryside, and, the most, par and most powerfully, test cricket and the racial stereotyping in the media. This presentation poses the question of whether it is possible for India intentionally or not, to uproot the remnants of the ideology and practices of white supremacy in and beyond the boundaries of cricket, and to create the conditions for a post-colonial cricket to flow back into the centre to undo the colonial and racial structure of attitude and reference at play in the Anglosphere. Two immediate questions emerge here. Why white supremacy and why India? The first has to do with the nature of the traditional British self-image, representation of others and colonial ideology, while the second involves a wide set of changes from the 1990s onwards in world political and cultural economy, which have led to the emergence of India as the major world power and as the epicenter of the cricketing world. In our considerations of these, we shall briefly review the key features of colonial cricket and note how they are being unraveled by a post-colonial cricketing culture centered in India. What does a colonial cricketing culture look like? How and where is it played? Who plays it? For whom? And with what motivating interests and passions? What forms of subjectivity have been incited and nourished in by this culture? And what does a post-colonial cricketing culture look like? Are there new forms of subjectivity incited here that can make it possible for the global color line to become a thing of the past? In other words, is it possible for India to orchestrate a form of cricket that would allow for a restructuring of relations among peoples and states that we in the 21st century can truly call civilized? In short, can India civilize cricket and even the Anglo-Australian bloc through cricket? Since its internationalization in the 19th century, cricket has been colored by race and racial ideology of white supremacy. We shall therefore refer to this form of cricket as colonial cricket. Saddled with pastoral images of civilized life on the village green and at famous cricket pavilions in England, colonial cricket became an instrument of the British civilizing mission in India and elsewhere. From the muscular Christianity movement in the second half of the 19th century and Lord Harris's belief that cricket was the classroom in God's air and sunshine, 
to the endemic racism in cricket coverage and practice in England and Australia, to the MCC's domination of world cricket until 1993, to the veto rights of England and Australia over all decisions in the ICC until 1993, colonial cricket has been an instrument of the racist ideology of civilizing South Asian and African peoples and a bastion of white privilege. For all its attractions, colonial cricket therefore violated the key tenets of quality, liberty and fair play of the European Enlightenment. And if we take the Enlightenment as the defining moment of European civilization, doesn't colonial cricket's violation make it, contra James, an uncivilized practice? And yet it was ardently represented and promoted by the British as exemplary of civilized conduct. The apparent contradiction between colonial cricket's civilizing claim and its fundamental violations of enlightenment principles can only be resolved if we take the claim as belonging to a particular nation, Britain. In short, it seems that Britain could only claim that colonial cricket was civilizing because the racist assumptions and exclusions of colonial cricket reflected how Britain viewed itself and others. Britain, perhaps out of ignorance or other meanings of civilization, or perhaps arrogance because of its increasing confidence in its own particular brands of truth and enlightenment in the 19th century, universalized its particularity mistaking its own civilization for civilization in general. For various reasons, currently India is leading the way in the effort to bowl out white supremacy and white privilege from within and around the boundaries of cricket. It has picked up from the direct confrontational nationalist revolt led by the West Indies against colonial cricket from the 1970s to the 1990s. However, unlike the nationalist revolt of the West Indies, where direct confrontation colored cricket's encounters, India has combined a nationalist challenge on the cricket field and revolution in cricket administration into a more subtle form of power, bypassing. By bypassing, I mean moving outside a field of force where one does not encounter the adversary directly where the knowledge which props up the old structure of power becomes re less relevant to success among, along the ultimate path of liberation and human conviviality, where the key to success is to not engage, to not know and see, or pretend to not know or see, to not overcome the adversary, but to decrease his significance and relevance, that is, his cultural power. As examples of the practice of bypassing, consider these. Asked to comment on the idea that the EWCB, the English and Wales Cricket Board, may be crippling the rights of an individual by restricting the participation of its contracted players in the IPL, Srinivasan, the current BCCI president, replied, that's their problem. We would rather concentrate on the players who are playing. When asked for his comments on former English captain Michael Vaughan's proposal for two divisions in test cricket, the BCCI president responded, why should I be concerned about what Vaughan has said? He's entitled to his opinion. Trinivasan's responses reflect a new, brash, self-confident India, riding on the cusp of a massive changes on the way in the subcontinent. This new constellation of forces have materialized so fast, within a decade, that the old order of test cricket and English domination is being rendered less significant. The ongoing post-colonization of cricket is also marked by commercialization, mediatization, and professionalization. For world cricket, these are adequately covered elsewhere, so I need not go into them here. But these processes have reached new heights in world cricket and in the Indian Premier League. Three of the most important architects of this post-colonization of cricket are Jack Mohan Dalmeya, N. Srinivasan, and the controversial Lalit Modi. Dalmia served as president of the BCCI and was the leading architect of cricket's commercialization and expansion. He took over as president of the ICC in 1997. According to ESPN Crick Info's website, Dalmia, commercial skills and flair for striking deals turned the cash strap ICC fortunes, which grew from a paltry $25,000 in 1997 to more than a billion dollars in 2000. Former CEO of the ICC, Malcolm Speed, with whom Dalmia had a troubled relationship, acknowledged in his memoir that Dalmia taught the ICC how to capitalize on its revenue stream. 
During Dalmia's term as ICC president, the organization's membership also grew to 101 countries from just 38 members in 1993. Today, Zimbabwe, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, affiliates and associates from Ireland to Malaysia are all, more often than not, willing to support India's vision of a new world cricketing order. Before his term at the ICC, Dalmia had already transformed India into the epicenter of cricketing world ensuring that India's financial attractions to global capital be sought after through sponsorships, broadcast deals, and other business tie-ups. India, it is said, now accounts for over 70% of all the, wor the world's cricket finances, and now finances the game globally. With its vast array of IT, business, and entertainment capital, India have skillfully made use of the opportunities offered by a globalized economy and modern communication technology to initiate the post-colonial revolution in cricket via the Indian Premier League. The Indian Premier League sprung up overnight in 2008, leaving everyone gasping for air. Post-colonial cricket arrived in the night, not stealthily as the old order may have expected, but with pace, brashness, and color. Bollywood din and money Indians and others, and yet with the humility of its particularity that it is a domestic competition that needs no world window, cricket or otherwise. Lalit Modi is credited with almost single-handedly moving the IPL from a BCCI subcommittee into the richest domestic tournament and one of the richest sporting leagues in the world. As Champion League's chairman in 2008, Modi was able to secure a deal with ESPN worth $1 billion for global rights for the league for 10 years. Not to be undone are India's Bollywood stars, uh, Amitabh Bachchan, Priyanka Chopra, Preeti Zinta, Shah Rukh Khan, and others, the latter be two, the major shareholders in the Calcutta Knight Riders franchise. With others, they have been able to combine cricket and entertainment, and indeed transform cricket into entertainment, into something families can enjoy. India's massive population has been the social basis of the ongoing post-colonization of cricket. India's business, technology, and entertainment professionals have finally leveraged the business and political potential of the subcontinent's massive population, the traditional carrier of the nation's burden, guilt, and shame. The nation's burgeoning middle class has been a strong draw for sponsors and advertisers, enabling huge amounts of money to come into India and cricket. It has allowed cricket to remain competitive with other sports and become a real professional career alternative for aspiring players and, and other cricket professionals of all nations and backgrounds. And with the IPL English County Cricket, the traditional privileged place for cricket employment for cricketers and coaches from all over the world, reacted by first ignoring the IPL, then began sending out threats of excluding players who joined the IPL as it sees the writing on the wall. Yes, cricket is in the 21st century, smells of God's air, but with Indian rupees, not the village green over which the curfew tolls the knell of parting day. And what of England's national response? While all other cricketing countries have turned a cooperative face to the IPL, England still seems at a loss as to how to respond. From condemning the Indian domination of cricket at the Cowdery Lecture in 2009, to demanding that India take more responsibility for the game, from seeking deals with people of unknown quantity, Stanford, to threatening to ban the players for playing in the IPL, and from pronouncing that the IPL is India's domestic affair to asking India to reschedule its IPL games. England seems confused, lost, and alone as, it play, as its players demand higher pay packets and warn of IPL frustration. England is still expecting India to make adjustments to ensure the health of English cricket. After years of racial scorn and colonial exclusion, India does not seem in a hurry to do so. Meanwhile, for six years now, a cosmopolitanism never before witnessed in cricket has been staged in India since 2008 as players from Australia, the West Indies, South Africa, Sri Lanka, New Zealand and elsewhere participate in the IPL, become many becoming instant millionaires and superstars. In this cosmopolitan cricket world of the IPL, we find post-colonial anomalies like the Afro-West Indian cricketer Chris Gale becoming a Hindu columnist, and Prabhu, while his traditional West Indian teammate, 
Karen Pollard has become a Mumbai Indian. Watching Chris Gale, Karen Pollard, Dwayne Bravo, and other West Indian cricketers being adopted and celebrated in India by Indian fans for the phenomenal cricketers they are. Seeing Gale on Indian television being called Prabhu, the Supreme God, by Bollywood superstar Priyanka Chopra and saying Jai Ho in a Pepsi commercial are signs of the new cricket post-nationalism in the making. They stand as powerful signs of the IPL's undoing of the exclusionary form of racial and national identities so long tied to cricket. They also demonstrate that the new professionalism in cricket does not have to travel under national flags or with old colonial hang-ups and memories. I have chosen to focus on these West Indian because their IPL career seemed to call into question the way in which Indians in the Caribbean have traditionally been positioned in the region's nationalist historical discourse, namely as people who, as indentured laborers, supposedly took racial hatred for Africans from the Indian caste system to the Caribbean in the 19th century and unfairly benefited from the end of African enslavement. This commingling of people from various parts of the world, many whom have been in direct fierce competition under national flags and national, narrow nationalist sentiments, now find a place in the Indian Premier League to interact as humans, upholding the principles of enlightenment, cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism and humanism, and indeed the dream of a post-colonial civilization. Can this Indian form of cricket invested as it is with an unprecedented cosmopolitan spirit and post-national conviviality, flow back into England and disarticulate the old colonial structures? I had a question that kind of, in some ways, cuts across both papers, which but picks up on the first kind of reference to imagined community. And in a sense, one thing that I was thinking about when uh, Bobby Hill was talking about the kind of debt, uh, or his argument about the debt that James has to leave us is some of the kind of perhaps tensions around uh, James's borrowing on kind of quite organic notions of community in Beyond a Boundary. Um, and I wondered how that, how a critique of that might trouble uh, an engagement with the imagined community, thinking back to Pata Chatterjee's questioning kind of whose imagined community is shaped um, and his kind of critique of Benedict Anderson's work. And my, my question flowing from that is, how might we consider in different terms the kinds of cr cricket and communities being, being kind of constituted? And in relationship to that, I really want to kind of insist that the kind of IPL be situated within the kind of huge inequalities in terms of kind of contemporary neoliberalization in India. So it's just a question around how might a critical engagement with the imagined communities kind of challenge some of the kind of ways in which we think about cricketing kind of cultures and community. Wow, there's so much there. I, when the, uh, you know, the plenary speaker this morning, Professor Hill, was speaking, was talking about Levis, I got so excited because he was so much a part of my exam requirements <laughs> at the University of Calcutta <laughs> and David Daichi's. And, you know, I, I taught mostly in the United States and no one's heard of these people there. So that to me is sort of an imagined community of us empire's children who read or read these people that, you know, Americans have never heard of. And uh, all the way, I mean, as I said in my paper, I've written a book about children's <coughs> literature and the empire. And anyway, I was sitting, you know, around the table with uh, friends, you know, when I was a student in America, with friends from Kenya and Trinidad and all over the, you know, former British Empire. And we were talking about Enid Blyton. And the American students were saying, who the heck are you talking about? We've never heard of this person. So I sort of envisage it in that way. Uh, but an imagined community that has been expanded, not just physically, but in terms of who belongs, and I think as you very well pointed out, 
uh, whose right is it, you know? And, and that's what really intrigued me about James's book is that he, he doesn't see it as an appropriation. He sees it as a birthright. And that's a very big move towards multiple centers. And just one quick comment. Um, in terms of your last remark, I was just thinking of the fact that in England, one never sees, at least I have never seen, well, England doesn't have street urchins the way India does, but I, I've never seen sort of children in impoverished areas of London playing street cricket the way you see in India, where little boys who have nothing else find a battered tennis ball and the twig of a tree and set up a cricket game. So... Pardon? <laughs> Bradford? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> well, we are going there. <laughs> Thank you. It seems that the IPL, the way it approaches the, the world community is that there is room for everyone. And uh, of course, um, that might not be because of a vision of something, a social vision. That may be precisely because of the role of global capital. You see, so I'm not sure that uh, that there is, like I said, it may or may not be India's intention to stage a kind of post-colonial uh, cosmopolitanism, but uh, it may be something that is pushed m mainly by global capital as much as by anything else that India may or may not think. Indian Indian leadership, Indian uh, BCCI, and the part and and those involved. So there's room for everyone at the table. To paraphrase um, MSCs here. Um, about the inequalities within India and this space in which you know uh, the IPL is taking place, um, how can I respond to this? You know, um, twenty years of uh, ne neoliberalism has done more for India in terms of meeting the needs of people, uh, bread and butter needs of people in India, than than the previous thirty years have done. So, um, neoliberalism is not always a bad thing. Um, so that's that's what I would. That's my only answer to that question. I think one thing that might come out of these, not only the two papers but some other discussion, is a challenge to some of the accepted uh, visions of what classical British English cricket represented. And here, I think James partly gets it wrong. That I mean. I, I know it was uh, just a, a, an image we had, but the idea of a village cricket uh, is, yes, part of the truth, but uh, in the north of England, uh, cricket emerges out of towns and cities and is very much a working class enterprise. And I even wonder whether what Bob was talking about of of the creative role of the audience, uh, of, the wor of workers as mm -hmm. audience, is restricted simply to their audience. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to another question, which I think is uh, involved in this very important discussion of post-colonial Indian-dominated uh, potential. Uh, and that is that it seems to me that uh, the part of that process, quite apart from whether it's geographically based in India, is a further a capitalization of the social relations of cricket. On one level, the corporate identities. And I think one can see what can happen if one looks particularly at English football where there is a total disjuncture between ownership and spectatorism mm -hmm. because of, uh, of, of holding companies. And also in a lot of other sports, inc now including cricket, is that you're getting these international entities like ICC uh, or the Olympic, uh, international Olympic movement, which are enormous inter global corporate entities, and, and some of the problems involved in that needs to be brought into the equation. And finally, if I, uh, if I can, uh, 
the challenge, it seems to me, um, of post-colonial cricket that is faced in this country is has this other dimension, uh, uh, which is that it's also an internal problem within English society. And the place particularly of cricketers from the old Raj, from the Indian subcontinent, is still unresolved and is still in a way a problem, but it is actually, there is a movement from below, from Asian communities, to transform English cricket itself not just the establishment of it. But I'll be saying some more about that in the paper I gave after lunch, so I won't go, I won't elaborate further. Yeah. This is Rajinder Singh from Colorado, I'm Rashna's husband, and I'm not gonna talk about literature, but just the game of cricket. Uh, I'm from the old school, because I played cricket at the university level, and I'm not a fan of IPL. And recently I saw uh, uh, Indian Australia, India England series on TV, in, uh, uh, sitting in my uh, bedroom in, in the US, and the stadiums were almost empty in India. And this is the direct result of IPL. You know, people are not even showing up for first class cricket Ranji Trophy games. You know, it used to be in England, you didn't, people didn't, have, didn't show up for county cricket. In, in India, the stadiums are empty. Nobody's going there to watch cricket. So they're going to watch IPL, which I like to quote Alan McGrath, the for, former uh, Australian fast bowler who came to IPL. He said, I bowled more overs in one test, in one inning in a test match than the entire IPL tournament. So my response to that is the minimum age for IPL should be 35 years. It's meant for old people. <laughs> and uh, I've seen IPL bowlers bowl four overs and they're out of breath. So it maybe it suits the Indian physique, but it's all about money and uh, audience. I, I've talked to many people in my family who don't know anything about cricket, but they're excited about IPL. So which means they, they don't really understand cricket, okay? Cricket is about concentration, physique, stamina, and if you, and IPL is not conducive to that, you know? Uh, you got hit on the chest and there's a no ball. I mean, what kind of cricket is that, you know? As uh, Harry Truman said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. So that's, that is cricket, okay? IPL is, I don't know what IPL is. And um, I'm not very, uh, the BCCI in my opinion is a highly corrupt organization. Okay, so let's, and when money comes into the sports, uh, it's the same in the U.S. You know, it's all about making money. Uh, sports gets kind of, uh, as you're referring to football, and I wonder, uh, watching the FA semifinal, there are only two English players in the semifinal between Chelsea and Manchester City. What kind of English football is that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so IPL, I think, is, to me, is, uh, and IPL, like, T20 originated from England, isn't that right? It came out of England yes, because yes. you didn't have enough spectators. Mm -hmm. And India has, has, has captured that, and people aren't going there to watch test cricket. So it's, it's a shame. And if you continue to that, go that way, you're going, to, you're going to destroy cricket. Thank you. I have to agree with almost everything you have said there. But, you know, what I'm saying is that whether I like what is happening or I don't like what is happening, it is happening. And it is transforming cricket and cricket discourse and all the other things that are connected to that, including the, the racial and the um, uh, nationalist uh, uh, identities built around cricket. So, you know, that's my first answer to that. Whether the commercialization aspect and the corruption and stuff all involved in it, again, you know, one doesn't have to agree with that in order to see that this is having a serious implications for something, not just the game, but the representations of the game and the investments, the emotional, affective investments, and so on and so forth that are connected to the whole apparatus of cricket. That's all I'm trying to say here. I think much of the discussion has been about whether one likes IPL or not like IPL, whether they like the BCCI or not like the BCCI, whether India is dominating or not dominating. These are the facts. What do we make of these facts is another matter. So, yeah. Uh, well, thank you all very much. Can you join me in thanking Russian for